Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to a, uh, this is an exciting launch, but it's a differently exciting launch. Uh, we're about to see an entire Falcon Heavy be thrown away, which is uh, unusual to say the least, since we're so accustomed and so used to seeing SpaceX uh, reusing everything they possibly can, uh, except for launch pads in South Texas. So uh, today is going to be uh, a fun mission to watch because we're going to see SpaceX push the Falcon Heavy further than ever before. So, uh, you know, of course, if you guys have any questions about rocket launches, about which, you know, uh, particular missions, I see so many comments uh, while I'm sitting here, I'm reading the same ones like, when's it launching? Where is it launching from? Why are they expending it? Et cetera, et cetera. What, where is this rocket going? There's a little website that will answer this question every time. And remember, we always link to it in the description too, but it's a little website called everydayastronaut.com. And here you'll see that we have uh, a pre-launch preview for, um, you can click on upcoming launches and see a handful of articles written by our, our amazing website team, which will give you the rundown on every rocket. And this is important because um, this is important to me. I like to just see the facts up top. I don't need a bunch of filler. So that's what we do for you guys. We literally just put like everything you want to know about a mission. We just boom right there at the top of the article. So you can just get the simple rundown on everything. And then if you want more depth and more detail, we have that for you as well. So uh, this is subject to take off tonight here. So technically May 1st for um, for people on the that you know, on the other side of the uh, whatever that median line is, meridian something. I don't remember. Uh, basically, if you're in England or East, you uh, it's going to be May 1st when this thing takes off at at uh, 26. So just at, right after midnight, half you know 30 26 minutes after midnight. But for the rest of us in the world, it's actually taking off here um, on the East Coast. That's going to be 826. Is that right? No. Yeah, 826, um, 726 for me. The mission name, this is Viasat 3, Americas, and Arcturus. Uh, who is launching this? What you know? What is the launch provider? This is, of course, a SpaceX uh, launch. The customer, so the, the mission payload and, and the customers launching this is the um, Astronus Space Technologies and Viasat or Viasat, but I think it's technically Viasat, right? Uh, the rocket for this is the Falcon Heavy. Now this is interesting, because there's of course three main booster cores in a Falcon Heavy rocket, uh, but but the three that are being used today is booster 1052. That's an old, old booster. And dash eight means this is its eighth and final flight. Well, I mean, you don't know that it's your final unless you know, we know it's its final flight. Um, there's not like the eight doesn't denote that eight means the last, eight means that it's its eighth launch. It also has uh, booster 1053. That's the uh, one. Those are the two core boost or side boosters. I mean, so that's B 1053 three. So that one has barely flown at all. Uh, as and then we also have um, B 1068 one. That's the center core. Um, and this is what's really interesting. It's uh, uh, 293. Wait, 237 days turnaround time uh, for 1052 eight. Uh, was the last time it flew and 1,405 days. So what is that, like four years since <laughs> Booster 1053 flew? Um, that's crazy. I, I don't know why it hasn't flown since then. I don't know why they just haven't flown it since then. I just have no idea. Anyway, launch locations this is taking off from Launch Complex 39A from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The payload mass, 6,700 kilograms. That doesn't sound that heavy after you know we're seeing starlink missions that are in the you know 16 17 uh, thousand kilogram range 17 ton range so why is a falcon heavy needed to take 6700 kilograms into orbit and and not just like take it into orbit but even expending all of the cores what on earth requires that much performance okay geostationary orbit it's going to geostationary orbit okay a, a falcon Nine could launch 6,700 kilograms on a geostationary orbit. So what is so special about this? Well, it's not just going into geostationary or transfer orbit like what we normally see, where you uh, launch the payload and get its highest point, its apogee, um, up to geostationary orbit, and then you then the actual payload itself would normally have to slowly raise its orbit. We're talking like over months. Every time it gets up to the apogee, it would burn. And that slowly raises its orbit, uh, this perigee, its lowest point, until it circularizes up at geostationary orbit, which is something like, th what, 35,000 uh, kilometers away from, kilometers away from um, from Earth. 
so it's like 22,000 miles away from Earth. That's pretty pretty high orbit. But instead of just doing that, where it's doing a geostationary transfer orbit, or GTO as you might hear it, this one's doing a geostationary, direct to geostationary orbit. So the Falcon Heavy uh, upper stage, or same thing as the Falcon 9 upper stage, is going to go out on that first geostationary transfer orbit. Then once it gets up to Apogee, the actual rockets, you know, upper stage will do another burn and then put that um, and, and circularize the, the payload into its final geostationary orbit directly. It doesn't have to do any kind of, you know, sit there and do slow uh, orbit maneuver raises with a built-in thruster. The actual rocket is going to do the final burn up at, uh, you know, at that peak altitude to circularize it and put it into that geostationary orbit. So that um, takes a lot more performance. It takes... Uh, I don't know how much delta V. I would assume uh, several thousand meters per second, two thousand meters per second of delta V. Maybe not that much, you know, because geostationary orbit I think takes something like thirteen hundred or something for the initial. It might be. I don't know. It might be like fifteen hundred. If someone in chat knows how much um, exactly how much delta V is required to actually raise the orbit, I, it's it's a lot. It's not in, uh, inconsequential. So that's why they're actually expending the entire rocket. Is for that reason. Uh, will they be attempting to cover the first stage? No. All three boosters will crash into the Atlantic Ocean. This is a first for Falcon Heavy, uh, at least intentionally, to crash any of the boosters into the ocean. Well, not intentionally, because the last couple have... They're not really going to be recovering the center core anymore. Uh, we're used to seeing those side boosters land, though, back at the landing zone. This one, yikes. Just all three gone. Like, every other rocket in, in history, Delta... You know, even three core rockets, like the Delta IV Heavy, um, Titan Heavy when it flew. You know, I mean, this is... This is the way most rockets are, but we're so used to seeing Day them land. Two, RP1 load is complete. Ooh, we just heard that RP1 load is complete. I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but um, yeah, that's good. RP1 load is complete. So how's the weather looking? Oh, oh so the, these fairings, though, this is fun. Um, are they attempting to recover the fairings? Yes, they are. So this is not a fully expended mission. Um, they are going to be recovering the fairings. Uh, 1,960 kilometers downrange. That's, you know, 1,200 miles. That's really, really, really far away. That gives you a sense of how far this rocket is going, you know, before uh, they get to stage separation of the upper stage and then fairing separation. Those fairings are going to just, they're going very, very far. It's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, weather is currently 80% go for launch. This is the second launch of Falcon Heavy this year. The 29th mission for SpaceX this year, which is unbelievable. We're <laughs> not even to May yet, and... Yeah, that's pretty wild. This will be the sixth Falcon Heavy mission ever, so it's finally starting to, we're seeing it fly again. You know, every, at this point, it's about every three months, really, we're seeing it fly, which is really fun. Such a fun rocket. This is the 64th orbital launch attempt of 2023 in total. So SpaceX is making up about half again as they were last year. Uh, the furthest fairing recovery attempt um, at 1,960 kilometers. Previous record was 1,537 kilometers on USS F-67, another Falcon Heavy mission. So you can, that gives you a sense of how much more uh, delta V that center core is going to be putting in because it's it's you know a good what is that twenty you know twenty percent further down range or whatever that's pretty substantial. The longest turnaround time of a Falcon core ever one thousand four hundred five days, which is pretty ridiculous. So um, and this uh, yeah so if you want to read more about this um, what the uh, the Viasat and all of these things are doing um, yeah which is pretty cool. Go ahead and give this a read. And, of course, we talk about what the Falcon Heavy is, um, the Falcon Heavy boosters, all this stuff. Stage 2 lock loads uh, has started, I just heard. This was written by Austin DeSisto and Trevor Sesnick. So everyone say thank you to Austin and Trevor in the chat. Uh, it's always awesome to have such our, you know, our, our team does such a good job of keeping everything up to date and keeping us all informed. So, again, definitely check that out if you, um, yeah, if you haven't. And while you're online, too, if you guys want to help support what I do here and help pay for things like our our, our stuff down in, at Starbase uh, and you want to do it in a cool way, don't forget to go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Shop around. We are offering 10% off of our full flow stage combustion cycle merchandise today. Anything that says full flow, so including our, um, our hoodies and mugs uh, that say full flow stage combustion cycle. And also, don't forget, we are taking pre-orders for our new heat shield color changing mug. Um, which I'm really, really, really excited about. This this gets me really. Uh, this is like I'm just so excited to have this in my cupboard. Uh, unfortunately, we have not seen Starship re-enter yet to see its heat shield change um, from the black heat shield tiles to red. But if you guys want to support the work I do, 
Uh, check out our shop, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. That means the world to me, and it helps us uh, pay for everything we're trying to get done around here. So thank you so much for all your support. That being said, let's answer some of you guys' questions here before the live stream goes live with SpaceX. Um, and we'll uh, we'll see what we can get. Don't forget, you don't have to do any kind of super chat or anything. Of course, it's, uh, it's welcome and uh, it's much appreciated. But uh, we'll just try to get to as many questions as we can. But the, uh, first off, we got to say a couple thanks to James Power for becoming a member. Um, Musical Wolves, always love hearing you. Uh, how are the Falcon Heavy and Falcon able to prop load in relatively the same amount of time? So that's a good question. I'm assuming that it literally just means that they have to... Um, th there might be a limiting factor really uh, at the actual like quick disconnects, at the, at the actual interface between the ground system and the Falcon 9 and the, the booster rockets. Com uh, rocket boosters, sorry, compared to uh, the actual tankage. So, I, you know, I'm guessing there's just a flow limit there, and it was pretty easy to splay that out and, and, and distribute that through three cores, um, you know, without exceeding the maximum rates um, that that we're used to seeing. So that that might, you know, I'm, oh, that's right. We have a whole bunch of options here for, for resolution. I forget about that. That's always fun to see. Uh, Falcon, the SpaceX stream is starting to go live, so uh, we'll get this pulled up so that you guys can kind of be around here when this is going okay um let's see why did i get timed out justin i don't know why you got timed out i'm sorry that you did uh we do have some autobots that might time you out we also do have a, a little bit of a slow chat just so people you know we're trying to avoid spam and people just uh and and literally like bots spamming chat and stuff so sorry if you did i don't know i have no idea we have a pretty good um, pretty great mod team and maybe something happened by accident. Um, this is awesome. This is from Chris, uh, celebrating eight months of membership. Hey, Tim, you got me interested in the aerospace industry at age 35. Now I work for an Air Force contractor who keeps UH-1 and Hueys and Blackbirds flying. That's super cool. Well, thank you so much for saying hi and, uh, thank you for keeping those beautiful birds up in the air. That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, that's really cool. Uh, David has been supporting the channel for two years, four months, and 23 days. That's amazing, David. Holy crap. Uh, I learned so much from watching you. Don't That means a lot. We have a lot of really new, uh, fun, exciting things that we're, that I'm working on right now. Um, I realized YouTube is finally like kind of doing shorts correctly. I, I want to know your opinion. I, they shouldn't really be showing up in your main feed. I think there's kind of a separate shorts feed, which I think is good. Like I don't want to see like, shorts... Always just, you know, getting notifications the same way that I would a normal video. Um, so I am kind of doing a few shorts, that things that I would normally be posting on Instagram and TikTok and Twitter um, that are just little nuggets of information that I think are, are fun. Um, I have some of those that I had made for those other platforms and hadn't posted on YouTube that are just fun little descriptors of things. Um, and hopefully a, a decent way for new discovery. You know, we're always trying to get new people excited about spaceflight. And frankly, the, the younger generation really has the attention span of about a minute of just scrolling, you know, the death scroll. So I'm thinking it's important to, to kind of, in, you know, give an opportunity there for learning moments and, and new, new discoveries. Um, so I, I have been doing a few more of those just every now and then. So let, I hope you guys don't hate that. I mean, sorry if you do, uh, but you know, it's always about trying to reach new people and get more people excited. So, um, Let's see, this is from Jared McCorney. Uh, to more reliably, wait, to more reliably break up the stages during re-entry, would it be more preferable for the stage to fall horizontally or vertically to the windstream? Hang on, break up stages during, man, why is there buffering on this stream? This is not good. That's very unusual. We'll go 4K and see if there's something weird happening with the... Um, we'll go live. Just one second. We don't want this happening. I mean, I'm sitting on 10 gig internet here. There should be no problems. Yeah, 10 gig. We can't even get like 10 mega, megabits per second uh, uploading half the time down in, in South Texas. So this, it should be no problem. Anyone else having problems on the... Let's see. Um, oh, interesting. Hang on. I'm okay. Hmm. What is going on? We might have to do a little, give me one second here. Let's make sure that it's not anything on my end. That's really weird. I'll just give the old website a refresh. 
It'll abort the countdown to give teams on the ground extra time to review any potential issues before flight. The teams did work through these checks and the vehicle and payloads are healthy. We are now looking forward to liftoff just a few minutes from now. Today we have three payloads on the mission. Those are Viasat 3 as the primary payload for our customer Viasat. Viasat 3 is expected to be the world's highest capacity satellite and will be the largest all-electric satellite ever to be launched. In addition to Viasat 3, we also have two secondary payloads on board the second stage. Those two payloads are Astronus's MicroGeo satellite and Gravity's CubeSat Gravity Space 1. So we've already talked about this. I want to get back to Jared's uh, question here that I, I don't think I understood when I first read it. Now I'm going to give it another read through here and make sure you guys can read it. Okay, to more reliably break up. So we're talking about when you're expending a booster. Would it be uh, preferable for the stages to fall horizontal or vertical to the windstream? So in other words, we'll use this as a, as a good example. Um, would it be better when you're, when you're wanting to break these, these vehicles up during re-entry um, in, a, in a, you know, a situation like this where they're expended, is it better to have it fall, like let's say the, the wind stream's coming like this, you know, it's, it's coming in at a ballistic, uh, uh, on a ballistic trajectory. Is it better to come in like this or like this to try to break it up? Honestly, I don't know because coming in horizontally, you know, like this uh, perpendicular to the wind stream might slow it down. I would guess that would actually be the way though to to have it break up the, the quickest because I'm, I'm guessing it can't handle those kind of forces uh, longitudinally along it like that. Um, but at the same time, by the time that, if say it does survive uh, entry, unguided engines first, by the time it hits the water, it there's no way it's going to survive that. So um, you don't need it to completely break up. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing that it's totally fine to just go engines first. But um, yeah. Jesse Anderson, a production engineering manager here at SpaceX. Falcon Heavy is a two-stage vehicle, just like Falcon 9, but the first stage of Falcon Heavy uses three boosters, whereas Falcon 9 only has one. You can think of Falcon Heavy as essentially three Falcon 9 rockets strapped together, which means that it can carry much larger payloads. Each side booster has flown before, one booster having flown twice and the other seven times before. The center core is new, but as Atticus mentioned, we won't be attempting to recover our side boosters or center core on today's mission. Falcon Heavy has 28 engines total. Each one of Falcon Heavy's boosters has nine Merlin 1D engines, making for a total of 27 engines across all three boosters, and you can see that incredible view on your screen. At full power, these 27 engines produce the same thrust as 18 747 airplanes at takeoff. The 27th engine is a Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage and will power the payload to its final targeted orbit. Once, we, once the first and second stage separate, the second stage will propel our payload to its intended orbit. You'll notice some gray paint on the second stage today, and that's just to help absorb some of the heat from the sun to keep our fuel warm during the long flight today. And above the second stage is where our payloads are safely enclosed inside of the fairing, and that's what you're seeing there on your screen. The fairing protects the payload from aerothermal loads, heating, and contamination during ascent. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we no longer need this protection, so we will jettison the fairing as the second stage continues on its journey to orbit. We will be attempting to recover the fairing halves today with our recovery vessel named Doug. And speaking of fairings, today's launch marks the 100th flight of a reflown payload fairing. The Viasat 3 America's mission also marks the very first Falcon Heavy to launch with flight proven core, fairing halves. Viasat 3 is the first of three satellites to make up a new global constellation. So here's more about today's mission and payload. Every mission starts with a vision. Ours is simple and powerful. Break new ground in bringing connectivity where it's needed right, most. Uh, of course, we're going to get a, a strike here <laughs> for copyright strikes. That always happens. I did want to answer this, and this is, I, we'll see this a lot, but this is a, a good question from David Timmon. Uh, hey, Tim, why isn't SpaceX doing boost back and landings on a drone ship uh, recently? So, a boost, so. The only thing you actually get out of doing a boost back burn for a recovery mission is you basically reduce the, the distance that those recovery vessels have to go. Um, you do sacrifice some performance. So it all just depends on like how heavy is the payload, 
how much performance out of the rocket does it need? And it's always fun with, with a rocket to, to work backwards, to say, all right, we have a, I'm just going to make up numbers here. We have a 10-ton a payload, and that 10-ton payload um, needs to go to 500 kilometers in orbit. Okay, how much of that work can the first or the upper stage do? So you'll know by the payload mass, by the efficiency of the engine, by how much propellant there is, how much delta V the upper stage can do. We'll make up some numbers here again. We'll say it can do six kilometers per second of delta V. Totally making this up. No, not six. We'll say we'll say four, because uh, seven point eight kilometers per second will get you uh, into orbit. Then you can say, okay, so that with this payload and it can do four. So we need to get basically four uh, kilometers per second of delta V or you know, of energy out of the booster stage. So the booster stage now has to, if it has, let's say, um, you know, enough propellant to do that at stage separation, how much propellant is left over to make sure this can still get to that desired orbit. If there's enough propellant on board to do a boost back and reduce the amount of distance that, uh, that fleet needs to go, then they're going to do it because it's basically free, you know, free fuel savings, propellant savings, um, on, <laughs> on shipping that literally physically shipping that that drone ship out there that that's expensive the further away it is the more gas and and fuel that that uses the more um labor hours there are for the crew out there supporting the landing vessel so if they can shorten that time they do but rarely is there an opportunity to either do that or just do a full boost back burn and land it back at land so it's just certain missions with certain payloads and certain destinations is kind of that small sweet spot so we don't see it very often because it's it just doesn't happen that often. But I think recently, it was only, a, I think, three or four months ago, they did a boost back burn um, on a mission and still landed on the drone ship. It was just one of those sweet spot missions with the right performance uh, nece necessary. So um, let's see here. This is, um, what is your opinion on Orion versus Soyuz? Um, Orion versus Soyuz are completely different uh, different vehicles um so of course orion capsules at the heart of the artemis program capable of sending four humans out to the moon soyuz is just a low earth orbit uh little tiny more or less tin can capable of holding three humans um and it's you know it stems from the technology basically from the late 50s uh early 60s is when a lot of that technology i mean obviously it's been modernized from from vostok and um all that stuff uh but realistically the Soyuz capsules similar to what was flying in the in the sixties for sure seventies, so um, yeah, I would say Orion's much more modern, significantly roomier, like five or six times the internal volume, um, and just much much more modernized, a, a much um, yeah a, a large upgrade for for astronauts. I would not want to ride in a Soyuz with two other people out to the moon. I will I'll definitely put it that way. All right, we're gonna let them answer a few more questions here. And, uh, next we'll up in preparation for retraction the clamp arms around the second stage will open and then that truss structure next to next to the vehicle known as the strong back will start to retract away from the falcon heavy you can see those clamp arms starting go. to open up underneath of the fairing on the second stage there i love watching after this the strong back will retract away through. from the vehicle and this is to clear the way for ascent Strongback is used to provide structural support as well as routing for fluids. NY booster lock load complete. As well as routing for fluids and NY power booster, to the vehicle. Lock load complete. PY booster lock load complete. <laughs> we just heard locks loading finished up on the PY booster. Next up at around T minus two minutes, locks loading will complete on the second stage. Center core, After lock loading, loading finishes loading onto the second stage, the entire vehicle will be completely full with 2.8 million pounds of propellant. Lock load is complete. I, I was going to say, we're probably hearing too, because I actually have mission control audio pulled up, and that's at 1080, so it's lower latency than the 4K stream. So I'll, I'll mute that now so we don't get confused. But um, yeah, the vehicle's completely on track. Looking good. By the way, don't forget, this is a lightning-proven rocket now. The tower literally got struck with a huge bolt of lightning uh, a couple nights ago. So, yeah, lightning proven, baby. It, it is fun to see it uh, out of the pad and ready to go. More cooperative for this attempt today.
Oh, um, yes, you're right. I did forget to actually mention our coupon code uh, launch day. All one word, all lowercase for the full flow merchandise. So thank you. Sorry that I forgot to say that. Now, again, in just about 15 seconds, oh, we will be we completing go. locks loading on the second stage, which will wrap up the propellant loading phase of our countdown. So weird. Second seeing. stage locks load is complete. And there it is. Falcon Heavy is now fully loaded with 2.8 million pounds of propellant. Coming up next, we should see some white clouds venting from the TE locks line. This is completely normal and part of our closeout process. So that's just Following this, residuals. the vehicle will enter startup at T minus one minute. This is when the onboard flight computers take control of the countdown. And shortly after the vehicle enters the startup phase, our right, LD, our LD or launch director should give the final go for launch. Let's listen in for those call-outs. Oh, I won't forget. Okay, yeah, you're right. We better do a pointy end up, flamey end down check. Uh, once we have a wider view here, hopefully that'll allow us uh, a good opportunity to do that. I can see the pointy end. We do know. Okay, good. Pointy end is up. Flamey end is down on this rare butt naked Falcon Heavy. No landing attempt. This thing's all going in the drink. Falcon Heavy is in startup. Here we there go. There we go. Falcon Heavy has just entered the startup phase. This is where it aborted itself the other day. The computer didn't like something it saw. We didn't actually get any more information about that. But it looks like it's, it's... Go for launch. Cool. And with confirmation of go for launch from our launch director, Falcon Heavy is ready to go to space at T minus 37 seconds with the Viasat 3 mission. Get ready, and oh, don't forget, I will answer as many questions as I can afterwards, but for now, we've got a uh, 15 seconds. An imminent launch, so here we go, guys. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, engines full power, and lift off of Viasat 3, go Viasat, go Falcon Heavy. Yes. M1D chamber pressure is novel. We are 30 seconds into flight under the power of 5 million pounds of thrust. Falcon Heavy is headed to space. Now we are throttling down our engines on those side boosters and that's in preparation for max Q. Power and telemetry nominal. Max Q is the moment of peak mechanical stress. Falcon Heavy is supersonic. Peak mechanical stress on the vehicle. So we do slow down the vehicle to get through this period of high stress. And once we pass through max Q, we will throttle those engines back up on those side boosters. Max Q. And great call out, we have passed through max Q. So we're gonna throttle up those engines again on these side boosters. But they'll keep the center core actually throttled down so it has- You can uh, follow along the telemetry on your left hand, on the bottom left hand of your screen. You can see the speed and the altitude of the vehicle and some incredible views of Falcon Heavy in flight. Now, yep. two minutes into flight, we will reduce the thrust on the two side boosters again, and that will be to decrease the forces on the vehicle structure. And that's because the vehicle is now lighter as we're burning through the fuel on the vehicle, uh, but the thrust will remain constant. And wow, that looks amazing on the screen, all three boosters burning bright there. And they keep the center core throttled down so there's additional propellant left over. Um, so that you know everything so there's they can do booster separation There's still a good like third amount of propellant left over in that center core to be able to continue on Basically just aiding in that pushing of the upper stage so the upper stage can can you know get more done will be Biko That's booster engine cutoff That's where we will shut down the engines on the side boosters and then we will separate the side boosters from the center core 
And as a reminder, we are not landing our side boosters or center courts a day due to performance needed on today's mission. And you can see on your right hand screen, we do have a view of the separation mechanisms from the center core to the side boosters. There we go. It's likely flying the Pico, into or booster engine cutoff is coming up here in a few seconds. Yes. MVAC engine chill has started. Go. Booster engine cut off. Side booster separation confirmed. Looks Both good. Side boosters FTS is safe. Great views there. We had Beco booster engine cut off, and we watched as those side boosters and you could see them there on your screen. Those side boosters falling Vehicle away. Is falling an nominal trajectory. Falling away from Falcon Heavy center core. I'm not sure why they have cold gas thrusters. Awesome views. That's going to wrap it up for the side boosters today. The next event coming up here in about 30 seconds or so is main engine cutoff. That is also called Miko, and that will be on the center core, followed by stage separation and then the startup of our second stage engine. I look like a plane flew right through the vantage point there which at this point this is already hundreds of kilometers downrange. So very far away, um, but that I'm confused what path that could have been on from a tracking camera, but that definitely looked like a plane flew right. Main engine us. cut off. There we go. Center core cut off. Stage separation confirmed. Stage one FTS has saved. MVAC ignition. Amazing. Acquisition signal, Bermuda. And we got some great views. We watched Miko as the engines on the center core shut down, stage separation, and now you can see on your screen that the MVAC engine has ignited. Now we are coming up on fairing separation. So just a, a fun little note to... Separation confirmed. Okay, fairing separation. And also we're able to see and hear the call out that... Stage two is following a nominal trajectory. So I don't. I do want you guys to see that the the rocket has experienced sunset twice today. Because on the launch pad, it, it's, it experienced sunset. I don't know, 45 minutes ago or whenever it was out there in Florida, and then it flew up and got high enough where the sun basically rose again. And so its exhaust trail is going to peak out, and you'll see from pictures, hopefully from photographers and stuff, we'll see all of a sudden the exhaust will be illuminated in some spots. And then now it's flying away from the sun. It's flying east. So the sun is setting again for it. So it's actually able to see two completely separate sunsets, which is always a uh, pretty crazy thing. I had that happen once on a flight where I watched the sunset. We took off right when the sun set and it, and it came back up. It was really cool. Second stage engine before payload deployment. And now don't forget too, you know, the reason that this, the Merlin engine that you see on screen here, the, the upper stage engine, the reason this thing uh, is glowing bright red is because it's radiatively cooled. So it uses niobium, uh, thin, pretty thin niobium metal. And uh, the way that it, it releases some of the heat from the engine is by just radiating it out into space. There's no air there, so it can't conduct heat away, but it radiates it out. So it's glowing bright red. So if you had your hand uh, near it, you'd feel the heat through radiation, but you wouldn't feel it again through, through convection. On board as well from Gravity and Astronus. That is the Gravity Space One and Astronus's MicroGeo satellite. If you're just now joining us, we're currently in the middle of the first of three burns for this MVAC engine today. The next event coming up is in just under a minute and 15 seconds. We will have Seco One, or what we call Second Engine Cutoff One, and that will end the first of those three burns. Today's mission marks SpaceX's 28th launch this year, 227th overall mission to date, and our fifth operational Falcon Heavy mission. Operational, I was like, wait, this is not the fifth Falcon Heavy launch, fifth operational launch, because the demo mission made it six, got it. 
stage two, FTS has saved. Now on your right hand screen, you can see the MVAC engine. Stage two has entered terminal guidance. And we're getting good, good call outs there. On the bottom right hand of your screen, you can see the speed of the second stage as well as the altitude. And we are about 20 seconds or so from Seco 1. That's where we will shut down this MVAC engine and allow the vehicle to coast with the payloads on board. Looks like they lost the signal, Cape. So don't forget, it's going to do two more burns. It's first going to raise its orbit. Once it's in orbit, it'll be in a parking orbit. Then it'll coast to the point where it can raise its orbit out to the geostationary transfer orbit. And then it'll do another one once it's at the peak. And that's like four hours after the mission begins. And you could see that MVAC Maybe engine more. beginning to shut down. We did hear a call out for expected loss of signal. Nominal parking orbit. And we got confirmation of good orbit. So with confirmation of second engine cutoff and a good orbit, we'll be heading into a coast phase until our second relight of our MVAC engine around the T plus 30 minute mark. We'll come back to bring you live coverage of that second burn in about 20 minutes. So until then, sit back and enjoy the space tunes. Cool. Hey, I wonder if they'll play. I have a song that they, uh, a collaboration song that I did with test shot starfish who's uh who writes the music for this and uh so i sometimes you hear a song that i'm in on one of these live streams which is always a a big honor but it's not happening yet i'll let you know if i hear it and then, and then we'll listen to the space tunes so yeah that's uh that's an unusual way to see a falcon heavy mission is uh yeah is to see all three boosters just be completely expended and remember again they're doing that because basically instead of saving some propellant on board to do the boost back and landing and landing burns. Uh, they're instead just negating those and using that extra propellant to uh, accelerate the rocket all the way uh, into orbit. So uh, gives the upper stage, makes the upper stage do less work so it can do more work later on. And specifically in this case, do more work once it's at its peak altitude or apogee uh, to put it fully into geostationary orbit and not just geostationary transfer orbit. Okay, we've got a, a handful of questions to answer here. I'll try to get to as many as I can. I'm, I probably won't stick around. I'm not, not probably. I won't stick around for the entire mission all the way out to geostationary uh, orbit. Uh, but I will, I will stick around for the next 20 minutes and make sure we get to that, uh, that first uh, orbit, the geostationary transfer orbit first and, and through that. And then I'll probably sign out. Uh, I just wanted to, I was going to be watching this anyway. I finally got back here to Iowa, so I figured... I'd stream with you guys and hang out and answer some questions. So that said, let's answer some more questions. Again, um, you don't have to do super chats. We'll try to catch some good some good questions, and I'll get through as many of these as I can. Uh, from Robert, thank you so much. I try to recommend uh, you to everyone I know. I have kind of a silly question. When these rockets rud or rapidly unscheduled disassembly, when they blow up, do you think, uh, you know, for instance, Starship that just, that just blew up, do you think they can write it off as a business loss or just as a business expense? That's an interesting question. I think during the development, it just would be a regular business expense. Maybe once they're into operations and they and they see, um, I don't know. I, I'm not a tax expert, so I honestly have no idea. Um, yeah, I. That's a a good question. Do, do they write it off as a? I'm guessing probably just a, a business expense. I, I don't think they can write. I don't know. Not a tax expert. So if you are a rocket uh, company CFO. Don't listen to my advice on what I just said. That was not financial tax advice. <laughs> okay, this is from, from Steve. Hi, Steve. Good to hear from you. Hey, Tim, don't know if the stream is a real result of my tweet. It kind of was. You were like, you know, once I, I responded, I was like, you know what? If I'm home uh, and this thing is launching, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely cover it. So, yeah. Uh, glad to see you cover this launch. By the way, it's already, uh, it's already May 1st in the UK. It's currently just past 1 a.m. Well, there we go. Um, have some money for new cameras. Thank you. Yes, we're going to need to buy a lot of new equipment. Unfortunately, we did have some pretty substantial losses from the Starship test launch, um, as well as just, you know, operationally, it, what we're doing is not cheap anymore. And I'm okay with that. You know, I've, I've mentioned this, I don't, you know, my Patreon supporters hear me talk about this all the time during our live streams and stuff. Obviously what what we're doing is, is more important to me than, than trying to just maximize and milk profit out of this stuff. It's not profit, the live streams down at Starbase are not profitable. 
Um, they probably never will be, um, frankly. I, you know what? We might start doing like longer streams. You know how NSF has their cameras up all night and, and do stuff like that. I don't want to host it that long. But um, yeah, we definitely have um, losses just even flying crew around and paying for meals and cameras and all of the data and all of the expenses of everything. And it's okay. That's okay. That's what I, I'm so thankful to have the support of Patreon and, you know, you guys here doing memberships and all that stuff. And it, it totally makes it, you know, it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate that because there are some serious expenses uh, it just keeps kind of growing. We definitely have uh, scope creep. And, and frankly, I'm not done. I don't care. We're, I'm so happy with how our tracking footage went. We should have almost three of those trackers running. We had an error with one of them being down at the pad where we lost connectivity to it. Um, we're, we're already reworking a lot of things, and we're just going to get better and better and better now that we finally have some stuff set up and in place. Um, we fixed our audio issue. There was a legitimate audio issue during our thing. That was not something we could monitor and, and hear. Um, it was something in the server end. It's always these server end things like that plague us. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that we finally got some of that stuff worked out. So I uh, can't wait. Can't wait to get back at it. Hopefully, you know, Elon said in a Twitter spaces yesterday that I co-hosted with him that they're still expecting like six to eight weeks or something. To me, that sounds ridiculous. I would say more like six to eight months, in my opinion. I'll be shocked if, it, if we see another Starship launch this year, but I would I would love that. Uh, John Depker, awesome. Uh, celebrating 17 months of membership. We watched Starship launch on our maiden flight. Hopefully, I'll still be alive to see you fly on Starship. John, I sure hope so, too. I mean, I hope it's, you know, within... But, you know, by the end of the, the decade, I really, really hope to have, you know, taken that flight around the moon. I'm, I'm obviously very excited for that. Um, Fallen Comrades Gaming says... Hey, every astronaut been a fan for a long time. What's the possibility of Starship being able to be used for launching payloads like this with recovery, if operational? So... Yeah, actually, believe it or not, um, Starship, even without refueling, can do something like 21 tons to geostationary transfer orbit, not right to geo. Um, I would have to, we'd have to do some math on that to see if it's even possible to do geostation. I don't think it could do. So again, remember, every time you're speeding up or slowing down, uh, you're, you're using up propellant, you're using up delta V. You can basically think of like delta V as the, the range of your car, you know, how much how much range your car has. So um, let's say it takes, you know, a, to, to get out there now, because the crazy thing about recovering it from geostationary orbit is it would have to do that, the same burn that this is about to do. So don't forget, this rocket right now is parked in uh, low Earth orbit and just sitting there in low Earth orbit around Earth. Then it's going to do uh, an orbit raising maneuver. So it's going to sit there and fire for a decent amount of time. Um, I don't know how long they said. Probably It's probably like 10 to 20 seconds or something. To raise the orbit up to geostationary transfer orbit. That'll first raise the orbit up to, uh, you know, 35,000 kilometers at the peak. But the bottom of the orbit's still down here at the same low Earth orbit. So very elliptical. Then once, then it'll coast up for like four hours, get up to the peak of its orbit and speed up again. And that will slowly raise the perigee, lows the, raise the lowest point until it's circular. Now that burn, that that perigee raising maneuver to get it straight into geostationary orbit, you'd have to do that again with Starship to return it to Earth. You can't just be like, all right, I dropped off my payload in geostationary orbit and back to Earth we go, you know, like Superman or anything. You'd have to do another long burn at geostationary orbit to get you back down to this orbit and even a little bit below it so it dips into the atmosphere so the atmosphere can do the rest of the work. So for that, I don't think Starship has the capabilities because it's so big and heavy. So what they'd probably do for a mission like this, if they if they had to do something like this, would either be refuel it, you know, um, which is likely going to be most of their options, or they could potentially make like a kick stage version where inside the payload fairing there's a, a you know, basically a Falcon 9 kick stage or something like that. Uh, just to do those extra maneuvers, you know, maybe do a geostationary transfer orbit and then have a kick stage do the, you know, the geostationary, direct to geostationary orbit. Not sure what the options will be on the table, but frankly, if you can refuel your vehicle in low Earth orbit, no big deal. All right. Um, this is from Novix. I did a big science project on rockets and planes and your videos and website helped a ton. Thank you. That's awesome, Novix. Awesome. I love hearing that. I love that there's, uh, you know, People out there in school learning about this stuff and, and sharing their excitement with their with their friends and classmates. Amazing. Um, Paul, will the second stage ever deorbit or is it going to be permanent space debris? So when you have something in geostationary orbit, instead of trying to do, you know, there's not enough Delta V to, to return that stage back down and, and deorbit it. Instead, they kick it out into a, a graveyard orbit, they call it. So basically, it'll just fly away from geostationary orbit. 
um, and just get itself beyond, you know, even a, think about 200 kilometers or something away in space, a graveyard orbit, like that's a long ways away when your thing is smaller than, you know, a bathroom and there's infinite everything in between, you know, imagine, imagine just being a hundred kilometers away from another car on the road. Right. Um, and you're circling and your, your points will never intersect. So therefore it's not really space junk. Like it's, it's out there and it's dead, but it's barely contributing to any consideration for anything at all. Um, where is the fairing, uh, where is fairing recovery planned? Uh, 1950 kilometers downrange. So very, very far downrange along that, or that, that gray path that we're seeing on screen right now. Uh, it's, it's up towards the tippity tippity. Uh, this is going to be hard towards the top of us. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, this is exactly right. Jumbo smooth. They are not landing because they need all the fuel to get to orbit, but not just to get to orbit. They're in orbit now. But this, uh, the upper stage has a lot of propellant left over. So if they were just going to, to low Earth orbit, they could have easily done this on just a regular Falcon 9 and even landed back on the land like at the landing pad, uh, return to launch site landing. I mean, this would have been the easiest mission for a Falcon 9. 6,800 kilograms, that's nothing in Falcon 9 world. Um, so if they, so, you know, because it has to raise its orbit once to get it out to geostationary transfer orbit and then raise it again to get it actually into that orbit, that's why they have to... Uh, conserve all the fuel that w and use up all the fuel that would have been used for landing burns. Um, <laughs> how long did it take to get all the sand out of your hair from Starship launch? Well, it all landed on that hat. And like I said, I'll probably sell that hat, uh, you know, do a, a fundraiser or something with that hat uh, with some, some of the sand kicked up from the first ever orbital attempt of Starship. So yeah. Um, Oh, Rocket Fella in our Discord wants to know, is the Twitter Spaces session from last night available somewhere for Patreon supporters? I've seen a lot of people repost that on YouTube. Um, I didn't do that. I didn't feel like it's my content to share. Um, so I'm sure if you want to give that a re-listen, um, you can do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is uh, from Duck Designs. How do I print our shirts? They have such crazy detail and they look high quality. Well, thank you. It's <laughs> The whole store is honestly like... An unbelievable amount of work. We we actually have um, a totally separate, you know, it's almost like a separate business at this point. But um, but yeah, we we all the stuff is printed um, in bulk. You know, we actually do runs of shirts out in California, in Long Beach, California, is our warehouse and uh, Overcast Merchandise, which is my friend actually here from Iowa, from Iowa, from Cedar Falls, Iowa. Um, he does it for like you know big touring bands and stuff, and he'll do runs of merchandise and then sell it on the uh, you know on the road. And uh, yeah, so. He actually um, talked me into, you know, he's like, hey, I, I was doing like print on demand stuff like Printful and some of these other like Red Bubble services. I was doing Printful and he was like, dude, trust me, we can make a lot higher quality merchandise and, you know, do like custom tags and all the all the so on tags and all the cool things that we do. He's like our warehouse. We we can do all of that in house. And I was like, hey, that actually sounds awesome. And then that way it's like actually, you know, creating labor and jobs in the in the United States, which is really cool. So. Um, so, yeah, we actually do, we have a full blown like, you know, dedicated uh, staff doing the, the merchandise and, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's obviously not just for us. Like they have a lot of bands and stuff that they do a ton of bands, actually like big touring acts. So it's, it's really cool. And I really enjoy it because it allows us to do some, some fun things in our store that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Um, let's see, this is, what's the best way to prepare my son for an aerospace career? He's nine. Thank you so much, Aaron. I would say the best way is play Kerbal Space Program. Get Kerbal Space Program for, for your kid, for yourself, and uh, and enjoy it. Learn it. If you understand Kerbal Space Program, you know, it's obviously, it is just, it's a game, but it really teaches you so many principles and values and helps you understand physics and orbits um, in a way that I, I just, I, I haven't, that game taught me so much. That game is literally the reason uh, why I know almost anything about, especially orbital mechanics. I think I would have learned, you know, a lot of my deep dives on rockets and stuff is not from Kerbal, but the general knowledge of how it all works and stuff is from Kerbal Space Program. So if you have a console or a PC or a Mac, um, you can get it on the Steam store. I can't recommend it enough. Um, yeah, Kerbal Space Program 2 is out. It's more expensive, but it's, it's and it's still pretty buggy, but it, the bugs are getting squashed quickly. The teams uh, have been doing an amazing vision, uh, amazing vision, division, pirate division, um, private division, pirate, 
private division. Um, they've been doing an amazing job of getting rid of all the bugs and making it a much more enjoyable game. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, Bruno uh, wants to know, are you going to do a video about the last Starship launch? Honestly, no. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of reaction videos about it. Um, we posted our raw stuff. I don't typically talk about stuff after it happens. It just ends up not being very evergreen. And I think in the grand scheme of things, this is just a, another, it was an amazing launch. I'm working on a video. I kind of am working on a video, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what it's about right now. Um, but I'm, I'm almost done scripting it and I hope to shoot it before I have to leave for a week so that hopefully, uh, our editor can, Spencer can get working on that edit. Um, but, so I guess it's not about the last Starship launch, but it kind of is, but it's kind of not. I don't like to do just a totally topical video like that. I like to have them uh, be rooted in something else. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for becoming a member. I appreciate that very much. Um, don't forget to, members, uh, Patreon. If you, our Discord channel is still only available through uh, Patreon because of the all the integrations it has with the different tiers and everything. So if you want to join our Discord channel, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. But if you're a YouTube member, which thank you to our new members, uh, you can get access to uh, early access to videos and exclusive live streams as well. So thank you so much to Catherine. Um, and same with Gramps. Thank you so much for becoming a member. Gramps Izzy. I love that. Um, Steve, thank you also for uh, your, uh, your, your donation. Let's see. Um, <laughs> John Wick says, my friend and I had a converge, uh, conversation on us uh, on seven, on Starship 24 and Booster 7. As a running joke, we, all, we are always curious of horsepower to sheep power. Starship has 960 million. So is that sheep power? That is ridiculous. I don't even know what that is, and I love it. Uh, Chris McKee, thank you so much for becoming a member. Um, and Kitty, thank you for your 35 months, almost three years of membership. Um, this is uh, from Ground Umbilical Carrier Plate. <laughs> 44 months. Thanks for the stream, Tim. Can't wait to see you launching live. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's just going to be hard to even imagine still today. Um, this is from Elliot. Given the, the complexity of launching multiple payloads like in a, this mission, how does SpaceX manage the potential risks and challenges? I have no idea, to be honest. I think the biggest practice for them was SP, STP-2. Is that what it was? The second Falcon Heavy mission that was a demonstration mission had something like 60 some events to be able to deploy all the different payloads at totally different like orbits. If they could do that and learn staging and I mean, all of the intricacies of staging at different altitudes and, and you know, I mean, just I can't even imagine what went on behind the scenes for that mission. After that, anything like this is probably just an absolute walk in the park. They didn't even have to land the boosters. They didn't have to program any of that. This is probably just an absolute walk in the park so i'm not sure how they manage potential risks and challenges other than i guess that's exactly what engineering is is <laughs> managing risks and challenges um this is uh hey tim why has spacex been landing falcons on drone ships recently as opposed to landing back on the pad like these two so the main reason is they're maximizing the amount of performance they can get out of a falcon 9 when launching starlink missions uh the majority of launches we see today are starlink missions they make up, you know, uh, like two thirds or three quarters of all launches that SpaceX does these days. So they're maximizing the performance out of the Falcon 9 carrying Starlink. And to do that, um, literally it just comes down to like, what's the cheapest, how, you know, what's the cheapest operations we can do and literally per Starlink right now. And, and they realize that by uh, maximizing performance on the booster and doing a, a drone ship recovery as opposed to returning to launch site, they actually get better uh volume you know they get more payload into orbit than they would if they did a return to launch site landing so they get more starlings and they literally just say okay we have this much fuel on board we have it costs this much to launch this thing if we can launch um you know we'll say well, i'm just making up numbers 30 starlings versus 23 starlings um for the same amount of costs but now don't forget you do save a little bit of money and by a little, I mean probably still a million or two or $3 million or something between landing at land versus the drone ship because of all the fuel, all the personnel time and, and efforts there. Um, so there are some savings, but is that savings enough to negate how fewer satellites you can launch when you do that boost back burn? It's all a trade-off. It's always a trade. 
Um, so yeah, that's why they're they're mostly doing drone ship landings because they can get more performance out of it. Um, let's see, awesome. Apollo, how many model rockets do I own? Love your work. I mean, all over in my studio and in my house. I have model rockets kind of everywhere strewn throughout. Um, I have a handful. Now, the thing that ekes me though is that none of the rockets in the background are to scale with each other, um, except for the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, Falcon 9 there. They're all to scale. And that's why we're working on, you know, we have our, our Falcon 9 model rockets. These are, you know, made out of metal and um, pretty crazy. I don't know how many of you out there own one of these now, but, um, you know, these are 1 100 scale, which to me is the right scale. 1 100 is perfect. You can easily just think about this being 100 times bigger. When you measure a grid fin or something, you can just times it by 100 and convert from, you know, millimeters or I guess, what would it be? A thousand would be millimeter to meters. Um, 100 would be, what is that? A centimeter. There we go. Measure, go from centimeters to meters. Um, nice and easy. Um, yeah. So, of course, you know, if you guys, we do sell these at Everyday. We're almost sold out, by the way, of our latest batch. So, if you guys do want your own Falcon 9 model rocket with the extendable, you know, it's got little grid fins that pop out. Um, all the fun stuff. And again, these are metal, um, pretty seriously made um, pieces of machinery. EverydayAstronaut.com slash shop. Um, get your own 1 100 scale Falcon 9 model rocket. And we are working on other ones in the future. So the, the whole idea is I want everything that I have in the background to the same scale. Because it really bugs me that they're not to the same scale. There's no way a, a new Shepard is anywhere near as big as an Atlas V and Delta IV. Um, I got, actually, you know what? I said my the only things to scale with each other um, are my Falcon 9, but actually those ULA ones are also to the same scale. I'm going to put the stream on here in a second. Don't want to put this rocket down without the legs being deployed. Okay, let's listen in. Boosters or the center core, but our second stage is well on its way. Coming up next is the second of three total burns that the second stage needs to execute before payload deployment. Now for the, this next burn, we might lose ground station coverage, partly through the burn. So while we may not be able to confirm Seco 2 or good orbit immediately after, our team on console will be able to confirm this when we acquire signal from the next ground station. Now this burn should last just about two minutes and starting any second now. Two minutes to raise its, its orbit, that's incredible. So this is all propellant basically, I mean, the boosters and the upper stages, it doesn't work as a one-to-one. As you can see on your screen, we did just start up the second engine for the second burn. The purpose of this burn is to take us from a parking orbit in low Earth orbit and extend our apogee, or peak of the orbit, to an altitude of about 30,000 kilometers. So it's not like the, the fuel that would have been used uh, for a landing burn is not directly like you know, put back in because actually you can do a lot more work with less fuel with your upper stage because you're you're burning a more efficient engine with the, the vacuum Merlin as opposed to the you know Merlin engines on the on a core stage. Um, but there's also a lot less weight. You know, the stages are physically smaller. You've ditched the fairings, so the the propellant does a lot more work. Like a, a, the same amount of propellant would do a lot more work on a second stage than it would do on a first stage. So it's not like we're it's a one to one, but basically you can almost imagine that some of this propellant. Um, is what they saved because now this second stage has more propellant to be able to use for these maneuvers that would have been used normally for boost back burn and all that kind of stuff. Earlier, it does look like we have lost ground station coverage. So once we regain signal at the next ground station, we should hear a call out for Seco 2 and that stage two is in a good orbit. Now, as far as live coverage for our third and final burn, that will occur in a couple of hours from now at the T plus four hour and 22 minute mark. I hope you all stick with us, and we will see you then. Wow, that's going to be a long time. We have a few more questions that I'll try to get through, and then I'm going to be signing off. Uh, and in Discord, Juan was asking uh, something. They have landed one center core of a Falcon Heavy mission. Um, I believe it was the Arabsat 6A mission, the third Falcon Heavy mission, landed on the drone ship, but it actually did not make it back from sea. It fell over on the way back which is just the ultimate shame. So, um, yeah. All right. Fun little, sad little fact, but fun. That's the, probably the only time a center core is ever going to, to even be attempted to be recovered in modern times now. All right. Um, let's see. 
<laughs> Daniels says, Tim, I still can't believe that you almost missed uh, the lift off of Starship. We went from water towers can fly to big grain silos can fly. Actually, we went to skyscrapers can fly. I feel like the Starship, you know, suborbital hops, those were grain silos. Now we're like up to full blown skyscrapers can fly. Um, I did want to point out though that, you know, yes, we almost, I, I literally was like going to leave to go to the bathroom because I assumed, you know, we're in a hold. I thought that meant like 15 minutes or something. Um, and the problem is the live stream is like 30 or 40 seconds behind real time. So I have asked people at SpaceX if it's at all possible to broadcast those audio comms um, and commentary and stuff like that over ham or FM. So it'd be easier for people to be able to, you know, all those people watching in real time hear a proper countdown, three, two, one, lift off and stay up to date because we almost missed it. We had a lot of people turn cameras off. You know, we missed a couple shots because our operators turn cameras off and all of a sudden they look up and it's launch, you know, it's engines are lit. They're like, what? Because we just were not expecting it. Um, and unfortunately, because they only do a 4K stream, the 4K stream is is a lot further behind than the, the 1080 one. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Andy Builds, am I going to make a video about materials used to make rocket engines? I'm going to talk about a handful of that stuff in the how to keep a rocket engine cool video. We, we you know, we, we touch on a decent amount of that stuff. But, um, yeah, I... I, I don't, and we not, it's not always published. The exact material sciences aren't always published because a lot of that does get into like intellectual property. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how much I would have to, um, you know, offer for that necessarily. And it's not, I don't know, material science isn't exactly the most exciting topic for me. I'm sure it is for some people, but um, I have a lot of videos I'm trying to do. Um, let's see. <laughs> um Big dog, I'll, I'm just going to say this is one of the videos I'm working on. It's actually, it's become a two-part video. One is basically just the, the science behind getting to orbit and single stage to, you know, orbit versus getting to space and the rocket equation. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll answer something like that in the relatively near future. Um, let's see. Um, I mentioned once that the ship's flaps weren't entirely necessary. Why does SpaceX continue the application? I'm not sure when I would have mentioned that ship's flaps weren't necessary. I I think that might be a misquote. I don't I don't think I've ever if they wanted to expend the vehicle, then yeah, the the flaps and all the recovery hardware is completely unnecessary. But yeah, I don't I don't know what this is in reference to, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Okay. Sorry. I'm trying to keep up. Um, oh, awesome. Justin, I do dig your profile pic. I, I'm, I love that you're the alien in that picture. <laughs> um, let's see here. This is from Skullbones101. Is it possible, uh, to SpaceX and other companies and countries to leave space junk in a set orbit with the intention of collecting for scrap for future space built structures and ships. So realistically, we have to understand, imagine right now, it's hard to understand how the scale of all this stuff is. So even if we're talking about if every single rocket ever launched directly around the equator at exactly the same altitude, imagine having, okay, we've had what? Um, thousands of satellites by now, you know, we're at, I don't know, something like six or 7,000. I don't remember the exact number. These satellites, again, are about the size of, we'll say a car. Let's, let's be generous. Let's say these all these satellites, let's say there's 10,000 satellites and they're all car size. They're the size of an average sedan. And how big is the, uh, the equator in kilometers? Equator diameter, uh, circumference in diameter or in, in kilometers is 40,000 kilometers. So if there's 10,000, that means... If they're equally spaced around just the equator, they would be, uh, what is it, four, uh, yeah, like four kilometers apart from each other. You wouldn't hardly even see one from the other one, right? Okay, that's all at one very specific orbit. Not every satellite is anywhere near a specific orbit. Now pretend you just tilt that a little bit at, say, a 28.1 degree inclination or 28.5 degree inclination, like it's launching due east from uh, Cape Canaveral. Um, so what would happen then is every time they launch, if they're not on the exact same, uh, what's it called? Uh, what should we call it? The ascending node. If they're not basically on the exact same timing, like, you know, how Starlink satellites are all over the place. It looks like a, a crazy, like net of, of satellites. 
Um, so now you can imagine that now these satellites that have launched at different times in different places are completely on, on different orbital uh, orbital planes. So now they're not just 40 or 4 kilometers away. Now they can be hundreds of kilometers away going in different directions at different times and flying by each other. Now you take into account different altitudes, different inclinations, different orbit types. There just really is no like parking, like graveyard in space. You know, just uh, again, this is where Kerbal Space Program comes in so handy because you get a sense of how hard it is to actually rendezvous with uh, something in orbit, how hard it is to actually, you know, have two things either collide or or miss each other. And all. I mean, space is big. Space is huge. Say we had 100,000 satellites and just at different altitudes. I mean, you wouldn't hardly see any of them from each other. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, if they were, if there was repeat things going to the exact same orbit on the exact same, you know, maybe going to the International Space Station or something, 51.6 degrees um, on the same exact orbit. And every time they used an upper stage, they just kept it in this like specific parking orbit, but that's a low Earth orbit. So it eventually just deorbit anyway. Yeah, I, I, it just doesn't really, um, really work out. Um, 27 Merlins equals how many Raptors? So the, the Merlin is about half as powerful as the Raptor engine, roughly half as powerful. So um, a little bit a little bit more than half, if I remember right. So it's probably something like um, 15 Raptor engines or something. Yeah. Well, actually, we can... We can it's, um, they call it 5 million pounds of thrust, and Starship is something more like 15 million pounds of thrust. So 27 would be, yeah. Yeah, it would be about, it'd be probably like 16 or 18 or something Raptor engines equals 27 Merlins. So not even half, about, yeah, like not even half as many as, um, as are on the first stage of, of the Super Heavy. Uh, let's see. What's the feasibility of the Black Arrow rocket HTP oxidizer for Falcon 9 and Starship? Um, high test peroxide oxidizer for Falcon 9 and Starship. Well, it's going to zero probably, honestly, because that's more expensive and it's less dense than oxidizer, uh, than, than liquid oxygen. O liquid oxygen is a fantastic performing oxidizer. Um, it's, yeah, honestly, either, you know, when you start getting into, um, yeah, I don't know what Black Arrow rocket actually is, though. But HTP, high test peroxide, is not the best oxidizer. Um, it, the good thing about it is that it's storable. It's storable at room temperature, so you don't have to worry about, you know, cryogenics and, and chilling it down to be able to, you know, get it into liquid form to put into your tanks. That's definitely a consideration with liquid oxygen. But at the end of the day, liquid oxygen is, is only down. I think the only thing that would pre perform better than it is, um, is it pentaborine or... Um, there is something that's a little bit better oxidizer, but yeah, it's real, 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 real nasty. Um, let's see. This is from Daniel Fulton. Is geosynchronous VO geos, geosynchronous VO geostationary a matter of orbital inclination? Uh, no, I think it's I think it's the exact same thing. Geo. That's actually a good question. You, don't forget that the difference here between this mission and a normal like GTO is the geostationary transfer orbit. Those missions are only doing this part of the mission. They're not doing. The next part of the mission, which is in like four hours, when they do the the uh, the perigee raise maneuver to circularize and get into that geostationary orbit, um, that's a good question though. Is geostationary any different than geosynchronous? I don't think it is. Um, let me double check that though, or maybe Discord. Let me know if, if I'm wrong about geostationary versus geosynchronous. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's the exact same thing. Um, hundredth flight of reflown fairings. Crazy. feel like just yesterday they were starting to recover them. SpaceX is so fast. And it is just ridiculous to, to understand how quickly things go from experimental into, you know, fruition and into normal practice. That's the thing. I'm, I can't believe how many people are like disgusted at how bad the Starship launch went. It's like, you guys, this is, this is how SpaceX does it. They try something. They just know it will. They were excited it got off the pad and didn't blow the pad up. Like, I know people, it looks crazy. Like, you know, concrete flew everywhere. And they, everything that got damaged, for the most part, was going to need to be replaced anyway. So, oh no. They kind of saved some cost on, like, excavation of, of stuff. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, this is a good question from uh, Kevin. My name's not Todd, though. It is Tim. Uh, am I ever going to make a model upgrade kit for Falcon 9 that makes it a Falcon Heavy? Um, maybe someday we'd consider like a something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if that would quite look right. 
because of the livery and stuff, and, and we'd have to change out the base. I don't know. We'd probably honestly just sell a separate model. Uh, maybe that separate model, though, could be changeable into a Falcon 9, but I don't think we have plans. I don't know how we could retrofit it, honestly. Um, uh, how uh, This is from Go for Launch. Thank you so much. Uh, how does SpaceX refurbish their boosters for another flight, as in re uh, resetting the landing legs, stowing the grid fins, and, and checking on systems? Well, they have uh, a few places now out of the Cape, specifically, where they can uh, do all that refurbishment. So I'm sure they just have a whole set of things. You know, they have to flush the engines to make sure they don't develop uh, coking and, and get carbon deposits all, them, all up in them. And, you know, we know they, they run th some cleaning, basically cleaning fluid through the, the Merlin engines. Uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, how exactly they do it. But, you know, you can see them collapse legs out at the Cape. There's a lot of videos of them collapsing legs. Um, and that requires like a whole system to, to do that the legs aren't automatically collapsible. They have to be um, collapsed with outside systems, not like built into the vehicle. Um, yeah. Geosynchronous, geosynchronous satellites can have any inclination. The key difference is that geostationary or lie on the same plane as the equator. There we go. Thank you so much. Uh, not a Ninja 52 in Discord. Um, that's something, yeah, I did not realize. Geosynchronous. Um, yeah, geosynchronous satellites can have any inclination, but they're out there at that same where they're orbiting once every day. So 24 hours is how long it takes it to do complete an orbit. Uh, geostationary orbits are ones that are exactly on the same plane as the equator. So they're, that's good to know. That's very good to know. Um, let's see here. Thank you so much to Felipe and Pierre. Um, very much appreciate it here. Um, Harsh Shash Shah wants to know, hey, Tim, will there be a Starbase interview this year? Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe we'll get something figured out here um, in the near future. Um, thank you so much to Jolette for the, the generous donation. Much, much, much appreciated. And uh, let's see here. Kent Harrington um, becoming, a, becoming a member. Thank you so much. And Justin Mead. Good to see you again, Justin. Uh, let's see here. This is from Warren. Um, order some items, including the mug, and appreciate your content. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Warren. I really appreciate the support. It really, really means the world. Um, Selden Namar, keep up the great work. Do you know if they run the booster engines at higher throttle than normal because they are expending them? So no, not at a higher throttle. Um, the You don't really gain... I have to be careful how I say this because... Technically, boosters, uh, engines can run beyond 100% throttle in a lot of cases. I don't think SpaceX rates their engines in that way, though. Um, they can't can't exceed 100% operational without blowing up. Um, unlike the RS-25 engine, actually regularly exceeds 100% throttle as part of its mission profile. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, so you don't really gain that much performance out of throttling higher. In this case, they actually want to throttle the center core down as low as possible um, to be able to to conserve propellant inside that center core, let the side boosters do as much work as possible. So that's the key difference is um, you're uh, making the side boosters do more work than they normally would. They're kind of holding on longer in a sense. So instead of like letting go and, and coming back and landing, they're holding on longer, doing more work so the center core doesn't have to do that work. And then the center core, you know, has more propellant to do more work. So the second stage has more propellant to do more work. Hopefully that, um, yeah. Um, this is from uh, from Helmer Prince. I don't know if I pronounced that right or, or Jelmer. Probably, probably Helmer. Will I be making videos about my preparations for Dear Moon? Yes. So there will be um, to be determined how exactly things like that are published, what types of things can be published. Um, that's stuff that we have to work directly with SpaceX and uh, and the Dear Moon teams to to do. But yes, I absolutely plan to share. Um, some of it might not be, you know, behind the scenes uh, as I would like, but I'll, I'll hopefully be able to do some just kind of vlog style things talking about the types of things that we've been working on. I'm excited to share that with you guys, though. Um, YKK, I just pushed a Falcon. Uh, I just pushed a Falcon Heavy harder than ever before. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, thank you very much. I'm not even going to finish reading that one. Congratulations. <laughs> Vekas, evening from Cincinnati. What do you think about Elon's Twitter recap about the new changes for the launch pad at, for Starship? We, we kind of knew this was coming. He's talked about it already. We've already seen some of that hardware out there. Uh, I think the biggest uh, disbelief is that they didn't do those upgrades to the pad before they launched it for the first time. But I'm, I'm glad they did. I'm really glad that they launched it, honestly. And I'm really glad that they got the data out of the vehicle to know, you know, what types of things need to change. I can take these off because we're not going to... Nothing's going to happen for like four hours. So I'll just... 
do that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy they did it. We knew that they were going to be getting rid of those those propellant tanks at some point. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, nothing is that surprising. The launch went about it went better than I expected. I was happy to see it make it through Max Q. Um, yeah, the launch pad. Who cares? Ninety percent of that stuff was going to be replaced anyway. Um, USSF sixty seven Biko separation velocity was fifty five hundred kilometers per hour. This separated at fifteen thousand over three times the performance that doesn't seem a oh, booster separate is that right that doesn't seem right for the booster engine separation let's let's look at, at Biko here um booster separation is right about meow you might have been looking at second stage separation booster separation is coming up uh, about 10,000 versus 5,500. So that's, um, not three times. Yeah, that, it's, it's, it's more, <laughs> but it, it, not quite double, but, um, oh, you guys can't even see that. Sorry. I had this hidden. Um, yeah, 10,200 ish kilometers an hour. 188 was booster separation here on the stream. Um, let me actually do this here i'll look up i'll look up ussf uss usf oh my gosh i'm just terrible at typing and existing uh let's see three months ago this one had booster separation pull this back up for you guys okay booster on this one was i think you're right about 5500 5,800 or so. So 5,800 versus 10,000. So, I mean, that is substantial. That is that is a big difference. But And that does illustrate kind of the performance difference. But not three times the performance out of the boosters. But it is, yeah, that's quite a bit more performance out of them. So good good thing to call out. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, that's crazy. Good to know. Uh, I'm going to go back here and have this pulled up just so we are staying in touch with this. Um, I don't think, like I said, I don't really expect anything to, to happen at all for four more hours. And we're going to, we're going to be out of here before then. So, uh, let me get through the rest of these questions and then I'm going to get out of here since we're already, uh, an hour and 20 into this launch and we're, I'm not sticking around for the whole time. So, uh, oh man, this is from just a guy. I missed the Starship launch because of school on the next Starship launch. Do you think it will launch during later times like today's Falcon Heavy did? I don't think so. Actually, I think the first handful of missions will be, um, during kind of those early hours um, out at Starbase. I don't think they're going to do night launches for a while until the vehicle's operational. Uh, I think they like to have that tracking and telemetry and all the, the good visual data of it. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I don't think so. But maybe it'll launch during the summer when you're not at school, and hopefully you don't have to miss it. Um, and thanks for saying hi, by the way. Some say, um, this is from Some Say. Thanks, Tim, for, for sharing. Your work is always incredible. Do you believe in extraterrestrial lives? Uh, what will you do if you see something weird when you're flying around the moon in Starship? So, I mean, extraterrestrial, I think just statistically, the odds of us being the only life form in the entire universe is basically zero. So I definitely think there's other life forms um, out in the in the rest of the universe. Like, I mean, there's a decent chance that, that we'll discover some form of, of, you know, bacterial life or something on other planets and other and, and moons. I, I won't be at all surprised. Like, if that happens, I'll be like, cool, yeah, that's, yeah, that seems about right. And I think that would obviously lend well to um, hypotheses that there's other uh, life forms and, you know, bacterial or otherwise in other solar systems and other, you know, and then that's just our galaxy. Then imagine other galaxies. I mean, I think the odds of us being alone are, like, basically zero. So... Um, what happens if, if I see something weird? When, I mean, you have to, again, remember... How small and insignificant, I think people think like, oh, you're in space, that's where aliens would be or something. It's like, again, knowing about orbits and, and how small and tiny and insignificant our little tiny, you know, starship rocket and upper stage would be compared to the everything else. Like, now this, anything weird, like alien life or something, it had to be on the same orbit. And I mean, it's just like, it's, I, I don't, I mean, uh, yeah, if... 
I'll just say if there's if there's smart and intelligent extraterrestrial life that, that visits, um, great claims require great evidence is always what I say. So I don't think that we're being constantly visited by um, other life forms. Um, I'm not going to rule out the idea that, you know, we're pretty, our species is pretty young. Who knows? Uh, 200,000 years ago, there could have been, or, you know, uh, 500,000 years ago, there could have been a, an alien life form that came and visited in a big, crazy ship, an intergalactic ship or something, and... No one was re- around to record the history of that, you know, or, or even to, to bear witness to it. So, yeah, that's kind of my, my thoughts on that. From Justin again, thank you so much. Is Starship technically funded by tax dollars because of the NASA HLS contract? How does that work exactly? So, I mean, in a, in a way, yeah, it's partially it's partially funded uh, by parts of the HLS contract in a similar way that Falcon 9 won contracts just to get the Falcon 9 and the Dragon Capsule awarded through um, through NASA. So taxpayers helped with the funding of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon Capsule. Um, but at the same time, the taxpayers are saving millions and millions and millions of dollars whenever they launch on a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy because it is cheaper by... Um, I would actually love to see that math. Every time a, a government payload is flying on a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy versus an Atlas V or a, or a Delta IV or Delta IV Heavy, how much money has been saved through... Um, an open bidding system, you know, so they're required to do, uh, allow people to, to submit proposals now, you know, and, and, and Atlas V is still, and, and now in the future, Vulcan has still won a handful of government contracts like that. But anymore, a lot of, I mean, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy are just winning so much stuff because it is by far the cheapest, and even, especially with NASA when it's like, hey, we have these performance capabilities at half the price or a third the price. And frankly, SpaceX could probably charge almost half as much as they are. Um, but there's no competition to do that, so there's no in, you know profit incentive profit incentive to charge less at all. There there needs to be pressure from other companies to be able to do that. <laughs> Vidvox, why is Max Verstappen a jerk? Listen, listen, listen. Yeah, this weekend was full of a little bit of drama for those of you that are F1 fans. Yeah, I I. I mean, if I got the chance to hang out with Max, I feel like he'd probably be fine. He'd probably be, but he's very competitive. That's all. His world is just all driving. Like that's you can tell. That's all the guy cares about is driving, driving fast. Um, and I feel like other people, uh, Daniel Ricardo or Hamilton or or Norris, um, would probably have a little bit more of a social life outside of just going fast in a car. That's my that's my personal perspective of that. Especially especially Danny Rick, Danny, let's hang out. Okay, that's all. Camille, thank you so much for <laughs> your tip. I love that we started talking Formula One in the middle of all this. Okay. Not sure. How will SpaceX get full flow stage combustion engines rated for humans for landing? Propulsive landings have always been uh, simple pressure fed hypergolic engines. And that's not true. Not all propulsive landings have always been simple pressure fed engines. Falcon 9, gas generator. This thing has landed. A hundred and what, like seven times now consecutively with only a single engine? Only one engine does the landing. If that engine goes out, boom, nothing. This thing is now, this thing has landed more times consecutively than the space shuttle ever launched consecutively. Think about that. I would, statistically, you'd be safer flying inside of a little like capsule in the interstate of a Falcon 9 booster and landing using propulsive landing of the Merlin engine than you would be flying on the space shuttle ever. That's crazy to think about. Starship, on the other hand, now people need to not conflate the fact that a lot of engines went out on this first launch. Those were like some of the first Raptor 2s ever built. They're old, they're not reliable, they were very little tested compared to what we see today. We see engines out there tested five times a day uh, just routinely, just, I mean, they've got that Raptor figured out way more now than they did when they built these Raptor 2s about two years ago already. So, um, you know, those engines were below, I think the highest number, I don't know, was something around 60 or something. And they've already built 300 Raptor engines by now. So you just have to remember how early on that was. Um, and there, for landing, there will always be three engines that light up. And they'll take it down to two, and they can actually land on one. So it's it's triply redundant in that way. So that's that's one of the ways they'll, they'll be able to human rate it. Um, yeah. Um, Joelette, who could have taken this payload to orbit if Falcon Heavy was not an option? I think the only other th- rocket currently flying that could have taken it. Well, Ariane Five probably could have. 
Um, because the Falcon Heavy is not actually great for geostationary because the Merlin uh, vacuum engine and the Merlin um, or the the upper stage engine of a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy isn't actually that great of an upper stage. It's actually a massively overpowered engine with relatively low performance. Um, something like a single RL10 engine is like 10 times less powerful than a Merlin engine um, with a lot higher specific impulse. So I think this thing gets 300 and 350, 345 seconds of specific impulse in, in vacuum, and an RL10B2 is something more like 455 seconds of specific impulse. So a good, you know, 25, 30% higher specific impulse um, means substantially better potential, and, and then a lighter dry mass. So the, the upper stages are a lot lighter on like an Atlas V, like a center upper stage is likely a lot lighter than than a one of these end, uh, than one, one of these stages, the dry mass, because its engine is lighter using super thin stainless steel uh, balloon tanks. So um, I'm pretty sure Delta IV Heavy would have been able to do this mission as well, and likely something like Ariane 5 probably could have done it too. Um, but yeah. Oh, Ariane 5 can't direct the Geo. Oh, that's right. It's not a reliable upper stage engine. So no, Ariane 5 cannot do. I forgot about that. That's actually kind of crazy. Huh. Yeah. So I guess uh, Delta IV Heavy is about the only thing I can think of. Uh, maybe. Probably not a Proton. Thank you so much, Juan, for, for reminding me about that. Uh, Wild Lee Coyote, thanks for bringing space for everyday people. Uh, rest in peace, all those cameras for Starship. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this all makes a big difference. I appreciate it. Andy Builds, will you ever do a video on materials used to make rocket uh, engines and how they make them? Yeah, sorry, Andy. I, I think I already answered that. Um, like I said, we, we kind of have some videos that talk a little bit about material science, like uh, why don't rocket engines melt? But I, like I said, I, it's not that I have a lot of video topics I want to do it. And getting into just uh, material science is not the most exciting thing to me. There's other people that probably know a lot more about that stuff and uh, would be a, a better voice of authority on that. Oh, that's awesome. If Daniel did, thank you so much. We've been watching for three years. Thanks for all you do for making space accessible to everyday people. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, this is from, uh, well, let, we'll answer another here. This is from Chad, Everyday Astronaut. Hey, Tim, does Falcon Heavy have a higher acceleration rate compared to Starship? And how does that affect the rocket's efficiency? So great question. Um, I have a video about why does Starship belly flop? And in that video, I talk about gravity drag and gra gravity losses. Um, I'll also be talking about that a little bit here um, in an upcoming video. But acceleration, especially for the first like minute or two while the rocket is, is going straight up, if it's slowly accelerating, it's actually wasting an unbelievable amount of its propellant. Because if you think about it, um, let's say you have a thrust to weight ratio of one to one, you're, you're producing exactly as much thrust as your rocket weighs, that rocket is just gonna sit there spewing out propellant, wasting propellant, going nowhere. So say you have a thrust to weight ratio of 1.1 to one, you're gonna slowly raise off the pad. So all of, so let's say it's going, let's just make up a number, it's going 11 meters per second uh, squared, so accelerating 11 meters per second. The first 9.8 meters per second is being uh, taken away by gravity. So um, you're wasting 90% of your fuel to gravity. That's called gravity loss, or gravity drag. So if an if rocket had a two to one thrust to weight ratio, so let's say it's accelerating at 20, not a net acceleration, but a, um, a overall acceleration of potentially 20 meters per second squared, you know, the first 10 meters per second are, are being taken away by gravity. So that'd be actually 10 times more work being done uh, just because you had a, a higher thrust to weight ratio. So the accelerations are relatively the same. You, you don't want to accelerate so fast that you're, there's, there's like a, a lots of happy compromises where if you obviously are, ex, are accelerating too fast, you could have put more fuel on the vehicle because you could have lifted more fuel um, and more propellant. So, you know, just, just because you're accelerating faster doesn't always mean it's better than not accelerating faster. So yeah, if it's, let's say you're accelerating at a two to one thrust to weight ratio, you probably could have weighed that rocket down with almost twice as much propellant and done a lot more work that way. That would have been more work you could have done. Uh, but there's, there's of course, trades. Like they're not going to make a, a Falcon 9 weigh, you know, a, a special Falcon 9 that weighs more uh, because it has an additional thrust to weight ratio or something like that. So hopefully that um, helps answer that question. Um, Big Dog, as removing parts weights from, uh, thank you so much for your, your donation, uh, from 
a rocket to the pad is ideal. Any reason a hydraulic assist of some kind isn't considered? Yes, we will be talking about that in a future video. I'll be talking about exactly that. Um, and we'll show you the exact amount of help and work that that does and launching from the equator, launching from aircraft, uh, not aircraft carriers, but uh, from aircraft. Um, it's gonna be a very fun video. Uh, Love Lyra, thank you so much for becoming a member. John Fusaro, thank you also for becoming a member. Uh, Charles, thank you so much for the donation. Um, let's see, just just check the website looking for Falcon 9, but can't find it. All right, let's go to the, let's go to, um, let's see, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. It should be right on the front page here. Um, let's, it's right there. <laughs> First thing on everydayastronaut.com slash shop, or second thing, I mean, after the heat shield mug is our model rocket. So these... You know, we're really, I, I love the packaging even is a really big deal for me. Like I, I want these to be not only the highest quality model rocket, like these are actually a properly produced model rocket, not just like a, you know, 3D printed thing. These are a high quality um, product with a, a proper box and, and even like an instruction manual and all that stuff. So we, we went above and beyond to make this uh, the absolute best model rocket you can buy, period. Um, and frankly, I mean, I know, I know it's still, pretty expensive trust me we tried really really hard to make this as as cheap as we could but not by uh we wanted the, the quality to be absolute peak i have a i've owned a lot of models in my life and what was most important to me is that this is the highest quality model someone could buy like i wanted this to be physically you know sturdy and metal and just beefy and detailed you're not going to find a higher a higher quality model than this that was first and foremost and then i said and i wanted it to be cheaper than anything else that you can buy. Um, and at the time, that was the cheapest. Now, granted, you can get a, uh, a model from uh, Estes, but it flies, so it's not like an actual like display piece. I wanted a, a display piece, something that, you know, with foldable landing legs and grid fins and all that stuff. So um, hopefully that helped you find it. Uh, Bruce, hey, Tim, I've uh, been following your, uh, you from the start. Thanks for keeping it real and keeping yourself grounded for now anyway. Was hoping to bump you, uh, bump into you at SPI back during SN11 days to buy you dinner in person, but here for now. Thank you so much, Bruce. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. I, I Sometimes my life is is wild and crazy, and it's hard to believe what types of things uh, I've been able to do and see, and all these launches that I've got to go to, and the people that I've met along the way. And to me, it's so important to, to continually be, you know, interacting with with people and making new friends along the way. That's, that's what's so fun for me, you know. Um, so thank you so much for saying that. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and to everyone that I that I run into, it's always uh, a pleasure to say hi. So, um, love meeting new people. So thank you so much, Bruce. I will I will this will go towards paying and and, uh, and feeding our team for the next Starship launch. Absolutely. Uh, the legacy. Since Starship takes off in a spiral and lands sideways, how do you ensure it is pointy side up, flaming and down? So it it doesn't necessarily take off in a spiral. It's pretty easy to see when Starship is launching it. It does have a pointy end up and a flamey end down still. Uh, thank you very much, The Legacy. Let's see. What is going on with Boeing? Will they launch? Oh, I hope so. Um, they're coming up on being... Uh, yeah, their demonstration mission will be over three years after SpaceX's demonstration mission. Not great. I mean, that's just plain and simple. It, it's disappointing. So, But what matters most... Beyond the disappointment, what matters most is that it's safe and becomes a good operational vehicle um, for the astronauts on board. Like that's, we want to have redundancy in that way, dissimilar redundancy where we have multiple options flying humans safely to the International Space Station. And for that purpose, I'm really excited for, for Starliner and I, I can't wait to see it fly with people and start getting some crews on the International Space Station because it is, you know, previously we were relying only on Soyuz. Thank you the absolute goodness that there we're not relying on Soyuz right now because it's had so many problems lately. Thank, I mean, I'm just so thankful that now we have the Dragon capsule and soon we'll have another option as well. So it's the more the merrier, but it is disappointing how long it took. So, um, DJ, would I, would I trade YouTube for a SpaceX job? No, that's why I'm still doing this. I, I love doing this. I love being able to do whatever I want. Um, chase these rabbit holes of, of learning, you know, things like the Soviet rocket engine video, some passion projects that would not be possible if I was working, you know, if I was working at SpaceX, there's no way I'd have time to do YouTube anymore. And, uh, and frankly, it's, it's a dream job. You know, I, I have the pleasure of meeting other aerospace with other aerospace companies like Stoke Aerospace. That, that video was 
awesome and Firefly doing things with Firefly, um, you know, doing things with Rocket Lab, doing all the, you know, I kind of get a, it's like, I have the dream job. Are you kidding me? I get to go kind of wherever I want and do whatever I want and meet whatever people along the way. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. So, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I love my job. It's stressful. It's long hours and, you know, working on a Sunday night right now, but that's what it is. Uh, thank you so much to, to uh, UBAFT, fluorine, yes, uh, chlorine trifluoride, uh, and nitrogen tetroxide. There's some other oxidizers. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Um, let's see here. This is from Benjamin. Hi, Tim. Thanks for your passionate and fun coverage of spaceflight. Uh, could you please tell us about your plans to use an extended fairing on the Falcon Heavy and when we might see an extended fairing mission? That's a great question. And actually, I think we have some answers to that now. I don't know if you saw last week, uh, it was announced that SpaceX actually won the bid um, to take over Slick 6E, the, the Vandenberg launch site. Let me let me actually pull up pictures of this. I, anytime we get to talk about Slick 6E, um, it makes me excited. Maybe it's just Slick 6, sorry, it's 4E. That is the E. Slick 6 launch complex. This is still one of my favorite things in the world. This beautiful, beautiful launch site. And let me get it pulled up here before I... Okay, um, yes, this, you're not seeing anything wrong. This is, obviously we all know that Florida does not have mountains, yet Florida is the only place where the space shuttle ever launched, but it was not going to be. For I mean, they were, they were getting close to launching a space shuttle, uh, close-ish to launching a space shuttle out of Vandenberg Space Force Base and from Slick 6. And now here's the crazy thing about this. This, uh, the last time it launched was just last year with the Delta IV Heavy, the last Delta IV Heavy to fly from the West Coast. There's two more Delta IV Heavies that will fly out of Florida, and then Delta IV Heavies retired. SpaceX won a bid to take over this launch complex. I'm guessing that, honestly, just having the the vertical facility like this, where they could have um, a vertical stacked fairing, payload fairing, and have the extended fairing, I think this has something to do with it. Because I don't know if you saw um, years ago... There was, uh, let me see, where was that? Maybe in Discord someone could link me to this faster than I can do it. But um, SpaceX um, Vertical Integration Tower LC-39A. Um, there was a mobile gantry. There we go. This is from, SpaceX had this uh, rendering with the extended fairing. And notice it has, you know, a mobile gantry similar to what they have out at Slick 6. And I, they did win, they won a, a bid for this. So I, I still expect to see this out of 39A, but there must be some missions now that are demanding use of, of polar orbits for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launching from California. So um, that's why they have Slick, my understanding is that's why they, they took over Slick 6 is to be able to offer some of those extended uh, payload options. So there must be some, some, you know, top secret military uh, missions that require this extended payload fairing that need to go into a polar orbit that are only flyable from Vandenberg and pretty, pretty amazing. So that's, we don't know anything more than that for now, but hopefully we do learn more about that. Um, Justin, thanks again so much. As far as stage zero is concerned, well, nobody's perfect, but way successful test in my opinion. Let's hope Elon time doesn't manifest again though. Of course it will. We're currently at like a 3.7 uh, to one ratio of Elon time. So when he says six to eight weeks, like I said, I, to me, that's almost more like six to eight months. Um, I will be shocked if Starship flies again this year. Um, I hope it does. I would love to see one more in this year. Elon said yesterday, he's, I think he said three to four he expects to see launch by the end of the year. We'll see. We'll see how long that the fixing up of that pad takes. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll look at this. It's not a UFO. I, I pointed it out on stream, even the, the thing at... T plus three minutes and 50 seconds. Um, and I, it's, it is confusing, but I'll bet you anything. It's just a good old um, airplane or something flying into view here. Let me get this pulled up. So don't forget, you're actually seeing, you're able to even see stars uh, fly. So these are stars you see going north, or not north, but up, because the camera is pointing down, tracking this the vehicle as it's going over the horizon. So you're seeing stars in the background. I don't know if you can see those little dots. And you see this. This is likely <laughs> UFO. Probably a very identifiable vehicle. So don't forget, the, the rocket goes up, then pitches over. At this point, it's already 100 kilometers in altitude. 
and probably already almost 100 kilometers downrange or more, maybe even at this point. Yeah, probably two or 300 kilometers downrange already. So this, this plane is probably flying outside of the exclusion zone. Um, it could be, so this tracking camera does appear to be pretty well uh, in line with the rocket. But um, yeah, it's literally, it could be a plane flying, you know, at, at, at 10 kilometers in altitude in, you know, outside of the exclusion zone, but between the rocket and the vantage point of the ground. But yeah, it does fly right through the rocket's perspective. Pretty good. You know what it also could be? It could also be one of the weather balloons. They really, that would actually be nuts if that was a weather balloon. UFO, you say? Or weather balloon. The old debate continues. Now, uh, yeah, that's, that's likely what that is. I'm sure we could actually track it on uh, some kind of, if someone wants to, I, I'll, I'll be interested to see. I'll bet some uh, aviation fan out there has already been like, oh, I already looked at the, uh, you know, flight aware and found exactly what this object was. And here's where it was. And here's the tra ground tracking camera. So uh, thank you so much from Gramps again. I really appreciate it. Um, Justin Meads on stage zero damage. Elon, the best part is no start. start the best part is no part starts to hold my beer. Yeah, expendable, you know, reusable rockets, expendable launch pads. <laughs> um, Uprooted Adventurer, thank you so much for becoming a member. Um, uh, Booper Nova wants to know uh, how it feels to be part of Dear Moon. I, I'd say the biggest honor so far and the most fun I've had is just being able to spend time with the crew. They are amazing people. And the more I get to know them, the more impressed I am with the selection process with um, the, the crew that was chosen. is just such a fun group of people that um, very thoughtful extremely talented group of people uh so i yeah I, I just feel honored just to even be amongst their presence so far it's it's been incredible um yeah we, we got to spend a decent amount of time down at starbase together uh two weeks ago or whenever that was now and it was amazing so feels great it feels really great josh king thank you also for becoming a member and the herman circus what's going on with blue origins rocket after it crashed last september so they're wrapping up the investigation they, they released some details on that about a month or two ago, and they're looking, I think they're already going to be flying again in May. Um, I think first uncrewed and then crewed already relatively soon thereafter. So it should be getting back to flight here pretty soon. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for that. I finally made it through all of the comments. I'm gonna get out of here. We're almost coming up on two hours of live streaming. I have not eaten dinner yet, so it is time for me to do that, my friends. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for, for hanging out with me and, and spending your Sunday night watching an Expended Falcon Heavy with me. It really, really means the world. Um, and, you know, again, thank you so much to all of you that, that uh, donated Super Chats and became new members and stuff. And, of course, for those of you that were shopping on everydayastronaut.com slash shop, thank you so much for your support. And don't forget, uh, we do have our, our color-changing mugs. We actually have more merch uh, like this in this line that are, that are coming out. It's just taking a little bit longer to get it all uh, finished up. So hopefully by the next Starship launch, we have a, a lot more cool things in store for you guys. We're uh, Allie from Gravity Coast. She's doing some amazing work and thinking of some amazing things to, to put in our store. So um, yeah, there'll be more coming. So stay tuned. Uh, but yeah, so everydayastronaut.com slash, uh, slash shop is where you go for the web store. Uh, I'll, and again, don't forget 10% off of all of our full flow stage combustion cycle merchandise. Uh, including our hoodies and stuff like that too, by using coupon code launch day, all one word, all lowercase for the next 24 hours. Uh, we'll get you 10% off of that. So launch launch day, all one word, all lowercase at checkout. We'll get you 10% off of full flow stitch combustion cycle merch. But that's going to be it. Oh, we'll, oh no, 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 no. From not Heisenberg, good to hear from you again, my friend. Uh, <laughs> we'll send you to Mars next. You're welcome. No, I still swear by it. I know I said I never wanted to go to space and now I'm going to the freaking moon but I'm not going to Mars. You, you can't get me to go to Mars. Famous last words. Watch and I get like, I'm not going to Mars. Don't make me go to Mars, please. <laughs> okay, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. It's been a pleasure. Have a great Sunday night. Bye, everybody.